Welcome to Radicards TV on Radicards.com. I'm your host, Patrick Greeno. What you're about to watch is a review of my entire experience at the 2019 National Sports Collectors Convention in Chicago. And in the video, I cover a variety of things I purchased at the show. I hope you enjoy it. Please subscribe and comment below. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Enjoy collecting. This is Patrick Greeno with the 2019 National Sports Collectors Convention. This is Tuesday night, so I flew in today, and this is the first time I actually traveled here by myself. Usually Dan's with me, so I just kind of follow him around, not paying attention to like the orange line or the blue line. So I'd ask around today, and I got uh, instructions on how to do it. It's not that big a deal, so which is nice, so that if I come back, I know how to do it. So um, if you're flying in from Midway, you take the orange line to Clark and Lake, and then you go down stairs to the blue line, O'Hare, and take that to Rosemont, and then you walk along, um, I think it's called North River, and basically right there, like the various hotels, there's like the Marriott, um, Obviously, Crown Plaza, Double Tree, and some other ones. But whatever the case is, they're like all kind of. There's a stretch of hotels, and uh, they're across the street from the convention center. I really like the Chicago venue a lot because um, everything's sort of centrally located. You know, I don't have to take a shuttle to the convention hall. Cleveland was great last year, but I had to take a shuttle. So if I was invited to do a breakfast um, with one of the dealers or something, I couldn't get there until a shuttle picked me up. Usually, would shuttle would pick me up when the convention center is open. Like it's like opens at nine, I get there at like nine thirty. So I, I have to unfortunately lose like a half hour or something. Um, whereas the Chicago venue, it's right across the street, so I can get up and just walk over and be there as early as I want to be there, as long as it's open to the VIP members, right? So whatever time frame they allow VIPs to go in, that's as early as I can get in. But I'm not having to wait for a shuttle, which is great. I really like that about the uh, Donald E. Stevens Convention Center uh, location for the National Convention. Another thing too about the, the rooms is that I usually room with somebody to cut the cost down on my hotel bill, but this time I couldn't get anybody to room with me. Um, and so I'm, I'm here with a double bed by myself, but that'll give me a lot of room to uh, spread out all the things, you know? Um, and so it'll be, it'll be really fun to, to shoot video this week. And, um, if you haven't watched episode 241 yet, go and watch that after you watch this because that was supposed to be published before the national trip even started. But I remember getting up early this morning and um, at like 9.30 and I got straight to just producing the video, the, the post-production and then uploading. But it was taking so much time to upload to YouTube, I just scrapped it and figured I would upload it when I got back, which is now. Um, and so, or as you're watching this, because right now, although it's Tuesday, you're watching this when I have returned and produced this final video that you're watching now. Uh, so definitely go back and watch that. We talk, Dan and I talk about uh, like buying strategies at the National and we talk about things like, you know, when to spend and what to spend money on, that kind of thing. It's kind of an interesting dialogue. It was supposed to go out, like I said, before the National Convention because it, it was like a preliminary video up to the National, but you know, time is of the essence, and so I couldn't get it out the door. No big deal. Um, so this video is going to be kind of a whole cumulative like um, video of all the different clips I've taken in at the, at this this year, 2019. So you'll see uh, a variety of different you know clips of me either doing this or with people or showcasing stuff I got and I hope you really enjoy it um, and, and I kind of walk you through the whole the whole process and I'm actually glad I'm not going to be spending my evenings this year producing blog posts at, in the evenings after the show because I free up my time to be more social and I really need to value that more um, because you know I look forward to this one week all year long you know 51 weeks I look forward to this one 52nd week of the year um, I'm not obviously not what I'm talking about, not like the end of December, but you know what I'm saying. Like I look forward all year to this one week. And so uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. I hope that you enjoy the content that I'm about to, that you're gonna, that you're about to watch. I packed light this year, but I, I changed the way I, I packed in the sense that I no longer have like 
really heavy compact shoulder bags full of everything. I, I, I use the roller um, piece of luggage so I can just drag. It was so much nicer. But I'm not taking that with me into the convention hall. I just brought that with me for my clothes and stuff, and so that'll stay at the hotel. No laptop this year, so my backpack's quite a bit lighter weight. And um, the binder, the show binder that I've been using over the last 20 some years, I didn't bring with me this time. I decided to go single row 800 count box and have everything penny sleeved. That way, I'm not carrying around a lot of extra stuff in my backpack, um, and I'm not spending a lot of time um, organizing things at the end of the day and putting them into the binder. That binder can get really heavy, and that binder can get overflow. It can overflow, and so I decided to go single row box 800 count this year, and I brought a bunch of used penny sleeves so that if I get stuff in like semi ridges, I can just you know remove them and then put them into the into the box. So. That was my strategy this year. I did bring a few pages in a half inch binder that I did bring with me, but that binder will be used in a different way, not for storing cards specifically, but should the 800 count box overflow, I did bring a few pages into a, uh, an extra overflow binder. Uh, so that'll be good. And I look forward to seeing what I can find this show. It's gonna be interesting to kind of like go through bargain bins again and because and, I've been thinking like do I still want to come here just to get the same old stuff I've always ever gotten uh, so we'll kind of see throughout the week how this goes but I hope you really like it thank you for tuning in and um, I think that's, that covers my Tuesday night dialogue deep thoughts <laughs> that covers my Tuesday night dialogue and uh, enjoy this video What's up, this is Patrick of Radicards.com and uh, today I'm going to be talking about my review of Wednesday and then my review of Thursday. Now I shot <laughs> the Wednesday video last night on my iPhone and when I did it cut off because I don't have enough data to like store all that. And the video last night was only like 14 minutes so we're going to be recording the these videos with my Handycam, uh, and it's okay because I've got notes here from yesterday that we discussed. So I'm going to talk about them again. Uh, yesterday was cool because, you know, I came to the National with one goal, just one goal, and that was to get an SP Jeter, 93 SP Jeter, because <clears throat> I was in the market for one in 2014, and I didn't buy one then. Uh, I was in the market for about an FEGS 85 at the time. You could get one for under 200. Now you're getting them for under 600. Sometimes you can find them for between four and five depending on who's selling and in what capacity. So for example, raw card review. There was one gentleman who had one yesterday, a raw card review 8.5 and he wanted 425 for it. And I thought that was fair considering what they were going for between five and 575. And I was like, well, it was the first one I'd seen on the show floor on Wednesday and much like marriage you don't marry the first girl you date and so I decided to hold and keep walking around so I get to the next row over and one gentleman has uh, an SP Jeter a BGS 85 but he also has a raw example and I was actually more curious about the raw example because um, if I, I, it's a cost savings obviously but also I feel like if I can find a really clean raw example, I can have it submitted and maybe get the grade that I want, 8.5 or a 9, BGS. I like the BGS sleeves, the inner sleeve. I know I can request that with PSA, but I just want to get my Jeter uh, sent in to BGS at some point. Uh, that You could do it on the show floor, but the wait times are really long, and I just didn't want to spend valuable show minutes standing in line. So I got this card which you can see here and I, I I was this is great it's got like the surface is real clean the corners don't have any white touch spots on them I mean it's a strong strong example and the guy asked 325 but um, we negotiated down to 250 for the raw example which I thought was great for considering what people are asking for raw examples on the show floor I've seen uh, common conditions for that card in raw shape are like fives 
you know, they're like low grade and people are asking for $500 for them. So I was really glad to get this one example for $250. I thought it was a great, great deal. Goodbye. So first day I get my Jeter SP and, and I'm set. I'm good because that's the one card I had my eye on to buy at this show. Finally have an SP Jeter all these years. So grab that and I, well actually I have it here. I'm just going to pull it out for you. So there it is again. You, everybody's seen this card. I'm just really excited about this this card. I'm really hoping to um, get scores a high grade when I do send it in. So uh, what else is on the list? Oh, you know the VIP reception was great again this year. You know, free pizza and then you get to um, have there's like autograph signings and then this year was cool because we had a panel of speakers. Uh, one guy that, that founded Stock X, this company that it's like an eBay access sort of an eBay for shoes and clothing and things like that. And then there were two other gentlemen and uh, Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk. People call him Gary V because his last name is three syllables and it's long, it takes a long time to pronounce. I always liked his last name because it, it has a really unique um, flow off of the when I when I said Vaynerchuk, it's very phonetically, it's very perfect to me. Uh, but Gary's always been a great dude. I followed him since 2010 and uh, just kind of like watched his career grow. I know he started out with winelibrary.tv and grew his wine business, his parents wine business to huge. Um, and he started uh, VaynerMedia and now he does, you know, consulting as a public speaker and um, he's a really nice guy. Just really humble, good dude. And he started out when he was really young selling baseball cards, like 87 Tops, like that was his thing. And I, I just, I've always kind of followed his, he's published a bunch of books, big time entrepreneur, um, just a really good dude. Um, and anybody who's talked negatively about him, just unfortunately just does not know enough about him. That's what I've learned, is that people who are, um, have, have little respect uh, and thing, nice things to say about him, like on Twitter, I've just realized those people just don't know who Gary Vaynerchuk is. Um, I, I, I have lots of respect for him and any, anybody who's in the hobby should because he's, you know, he's made himself into an icon and I really respect him a lot and you should too. Um, so he was on the panel, really outspoken guy, very colorful language, hilarious. I love his personality. Um, so he was there and we were able to like, um, see him in action. It's so cool that he's back in the hobby again. I mean, he's never really left, but he's ne you know, now he's more a part of the, the community in, in, a, in a richer way than I've ever seen before. So I was really glad to, to see that. And I got to meet him finally. After all these years, I finally met Gary Vaynerchuk. It's so cool. Um, and I, I was able to talk to him for a little bit and t tell him that, you know, I remember some clips from 2012 where he was um, uh, recording some things he was saying while he was on a plane. And it was really dark. There was minimal light, and uh, I, I just thought I just remember that he remembered it too, and I thought it was just a cool moment. And I asked him if he wanted to hop on board with me for an interview at some point for Ride a Card. So hopefully that'll happen. Uh, so really cool to see Gary Vaynerchuk at the show. Uh, really really awesome. Definitely connect with him on Twitter or wherever else he is. He's on various platforms. He's an early investor in a lot of them. So that was cool. That was a really cool um, uh, milestone in, in, in the, the 2019 National Collectors Commission. Uh, next on the list that we discussed yesterday, what we need to discuss again, is display case organization. Now, sometimes I go through the I serpentine the aisles, and what I've realized is that the amount of time I spend looking at a showcase and investigating its contents is sometimes but not always related to how organi organized their showcases are at that moment. So for example, sometimes you'll see guys have <clears throat> graded stuff fanned out or nicely organized in the showcase, great pricing is easily readily available, um, you know, good customer service, things just look nice. You kind of want to just kind of peruse, if you can't afford anything, you just kind of take, you know, maybe take a look at what's, what's in the showcase and then um, just, you know, experience what they've got. And then you might see something you want and say like, hey, what are you looking at? Whatever, you might negotiate. And then sometimes you look at showcases and it's just like a chaotic mess of disarray. Just stuff stacks in whichever way and um, 
there's like boxes, like shoe boxes on top of the stacks that are stacked every which way and organized in some unknown way. I don't even think anything's organized. Just, it's just just piles everywhere. I mean, it looks like an action movie. You know the types from the 80s with like guys in suits with guns shooting at other guys in suits with guns. It's just like explosions and all this. It's like that's what the showcases look like. They're just chaotic messes of nonsense. And so I, I, I look at them like, well, if they don't care about what they've got in the showcase, why should I care about what they've got in the showcase? Now, granted, I am right now saying that, but I, I, I might be discounting the quality of what they might have in there at what, whatever price. You know, um, I just say, that, like, dude, if you, if you care about what you've got to sell, you know, it might help massage the relationship you might have with a prospective customer because that prospective customer might also care about what you have in your showcase. But if you don't care about it, you know, I might care about it, but if you do care about it, I might care about it more. So uh, that's kind of cool, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit because um, uh, I, so there was one showcase that I bumped into at the show that um, is like that. And, you know, I, it's kind of too bad because, you know, you get the sellers who might not even be behind the counter or they're aloof. They just, like, don't pay attention. They're talking to their buddies. You know, and meanwhile, you're over here like, hey, can I... They just don't pay attention. A couple of times that happened today. Actually, there was one gentleman who uh, I was going to share. I, I brought sample packs of my products or my, my company's products to promote to dealers and um, just show them kind of what we got, what we have to to help, you know, um, minimize bunching and, you know, all the things that my, my, my company can help uh, enhance. So as I was talking to him, I was like, hey, good, you got a minute, and he got a phone call on his phone, he's like, hang on a second, he had to handle some other business thing he was dealing with that's completely unrelated related to the national, um, what sounded like it was back happening back at the house. While he was doing that, minutes were going by, and another customer next to me wanted to see a car, and he's like, hang on a second, let me take this call. He walked away, and a couple minutes later, I walked away, and I was like, man, that guy could have handled that much better, like i.e. have somebody else deal with his other business while he's at the show dealing with his this business whatever um so i kind of lost the opportunity to share my samples with that gentleman but whatever maybe i'll see him tomorrow i just feel like if you're at the show to sell a product um you know it's in your best interest to to manage your customers uh interactions in a highly productive efficient and friendly manner and uh, answering your phone and handling other business while you're dealing with this current business is, I think, in bad form. It's in bad taste, but, you know, you can't, <laughs> I can't help that. <laughs> so all I can do is make the most of my time. So I want to talk about display case organization and general sense of customer service and how it relates to uh, the buying experience. And that's kind of what I wanted to cover today. Uh, food spend savings. Now, my last year, my buddy, or actually, I'm sorry, two years ago, my buddy Dan and I were in Chicago, the same show, and we took Uber to the grocery store. It's pretty far away. You spend like 30 to 60 bucks, but you get the food for the whole week, and you don't have to go out to eat because eat can be like, you know, anywhere from 20 to 40 dollars for the for a, 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 like a meal out at some nice restaurant, whatever. Um, and the places here are they're they're kind of pricey, but they're nice. They're nice places. And if you're here, get Giordano's deep dish pizza at least one time. I've had it. It's delicious. Um, a friend, a bunch of friends of mine, they went out to eat tonight, and um, I wasn't invited. <laughs> That's okay. I have enough food here from yesterday's uh, a grocery store grocery store run to hold me over for the week, and maybe even I think I may have bought too much. Bananas are kind of like overripe, I think, which is too bad. Oh, whatever. Also, another food spend savings angle is that and I talked about this on the How to Plan for the National Sports Collectors Emission blog post that I published a couple years ago. Plan to go to Costco and load up on like jerky and peanuts and you know some M&Ms and dates and dried fruit. And then uh, measure like with you know individual bags out to like make eight bags of them throw two in your bag every night and so that you're not you don't forget them and you have some protein to on you you can just knock out really quickly and be back on the show floor without spending an arm and leg on like a pretzel or a piece of pizza or a burger they're expensive on the show floor believe me so uh that's a cost savings too just want to run that by you because that's really good stuff 
Uh, next on the list is the stuff I acquired today on the Thursday show. So I got the Jeter on Wednesday. And then today I picked up, let me grab these here. I picked up two cards today, two big ones. So something interesting about the show this year is that I decided to take a different angle. I, I was been trying to track how much money I'm spending on Junk Wax rookies because I always spend some amount of my budget on them. And so I was, I was more selective today, probably more than I should have been. Maybe I'll be more, um, uh, less, less conservative tomorrow, I guess, is where, where I'd be going with that. Uh, so I can maybe acquire more of them. But I did pick up a stack of Matt Maddox and uh, some, some Ripkins and some Ozzie Smiths and a Brett rookie and a Winfield rookie and some miscellaneous other stuff. But uh, there's a lot less of it this year, I've noticed than last last couple of years and i've had opportunities to buy more but i couldn't i couldn't agree on a certain price point which i probably should have just went with it but um i had to walk away and then come back and when i came back the stuff was sold but whatever I, it's, there's no shortage of this stuff it's, it's they printed it in high high volume so it doesn't really bother me but that's the kind of stuff i buy is the uh at least 70s into 80s stuff so picked up some stuff today small small margin stuff though like small amount of money on it and i'm just trying to pay better attention to how much money i'm putting into that stuff each show because really i like to i like to cherry pick nice singles too and those can be more expensive obviously because of what they are so i picked up two cards today um that are, we're going to talk about now my goal in the show generally is to uh, pick up one nice vintage card and then this year I was like, well, I'm going to pick up one nice vintage card and one nice modern card that's not a rookie card, okay? Usually I pick up rookie cards, I just like them. So the vintage cards doesn't have to be a rookie card either, just as a nice, good eye appeal, whatever, or it can be. So whatever the case is that I picked up my modern card today and another card that I just have been following for a while, we'll talk about. Both of these cards were on eBay and I was watching them. And I wanted to buy them, but I just couldn't, I couldn't get, I, we were too far apart on price. And I just wasn't feeling the price points. You got to sometimes walk away with price points. It can't be like, if it's 50 bucks more than you're willing to pay, don't pay it. You know, wait until you have an opportunity to pay what you need to pay. Now with one of ones, the, things can get kind of sticky there because it is a one of one. There's not, not going to be another opportunity to get this, or at least there may not be if the buyer doesn't relist it for a profit or whatever. But... I found these two cards in the show floor today, and I was like, wow, I've been watching both of these cards. Different sellers, so there were different different dealers on the boot, on the show floor, and I came across, I was like, man, I've been watching this one on eBay. This one here is a 94 Finest Steven Strasberg refractor that features the 1994 Finest design. They're number to 25. So this card was listed on eBay for 100 bucks for months, and I just watched it and watched it and watched it. And these are really... It's a clean, just a beautiful card. Really like this a lot. So these are serial number 25, and this guy wanted 100 bucks on eBay, and I was like, I, I, I don't want to spend 100 bucks on a, just a, I guess it'd be a random post-career, or post-rookie year uh, card, which is, it kind of is, but it's got a great, excellent um, redo of the 94 Finest design, and it's got one of my favorite players on it, Steven Strasburg. So we agreed on 60 on this one. He asked 75, and he put an emphasis on Pop 1. I don't care about the Pop reports. I'm not a registered collector. Even if I was, I still wouldn't care. But um, uh, we agreed on 60, and I think he and I were the only two people, probably on the floor, that thought this card was worth even 60 bucks. But I was happy to buy it from him, and he's a really nice guy. We talked for a while, um, and, and, and he and I both agreed that this was a really, really cool card to have. He also indicated that he had two other examples of the 25 of this card, the Strasburg, and they came back nines, and this was the, the third one he sent, and it got a 10. Um, I don't really care what grade it is. I just like the card. If it were a nine, obviously, I wouldn't be paying 60 for it. I'd probably be paying close to, like, 30, 35, but it doesn't matter to me. I just think it's a really cool card, a card and I was glad to get it, and I was really glad to see the archive. He gave it to me and um, just threw me one of the generic... Uh, graded card bags so I just to have it to protect it and get it home because I didn't bring any for myself. All the stuff I brought was to give away. Um, so that'll that'll get archived when I get home. Thing about these my bags is that 
Well, any bag is that you can put the stickers on the bag instead of on the, the, the case. So now when I get home, I have to, I have to peel that sticker off the, the PSA case, which, whatever, fine. Okay, so I got that. 2014 Finest Refractor, Steven Strasberg, 1994 Finest. I thought that was rad. Those are fun. Yeah. And then this other one, this guy was a hot prospect in 2010, and his base cards were like, I think like five bucks, six bucks, something like that. And so when I pulled, when I bought a bunch, I'm sorry, when I opened a bunch of 2010 Bowman Chrome Prospects, um, I was setting this guy's cards aside. I don't have them anymore, the base cards, because I sold that lot like two years ago, all the base stuff and this, that was in it, but this okay, I can get it again if I want to. It's available, they printed that card in a lot. So this is the Super Fractor version of this card. I've always liked these Super Fractors, and um, this card was on eBay. I, I want to say in 2015, it listed auction style and sold for like 50. Don't quote me on that. I'm just trying to remember. I think this was a raw sale at like 50. Then it was relisted at 150, and then relisted at 250, back down to 150, back up to 250, back down to 150. My, meanwhile, four years have passed. So I've watched this card, and it was since slabbed, degraded BGS 9. And I found it on the show floor today. This kid was had this booth, really knowledgeable, young kid. Uh, he's a businessman. Awesome to watch that and watch him in action. Really, really knowledgeable. A lot of potential. Really smart kid. He had it. This is the Trevor May. 2010 Bowman Chrome Prospects. Trevor May uh, prospect card. And it's my understanding Trevor May is still actually pitching in the majors. Someone said twins. I haven't looked it up yet, so it's just what I heard. Now, he asked 100, and I said 50, and he was like, no, I paid more than that. I was like, well, what would you pay for it? I want to make sure that you make money on this. He's like, well, I paid 70. I was like, well, what makes sense to you? And we agreed on 80. And so uh, that, was, that was an easy buy for me, a no-brainer. Uh, a guy who was popular in 2010 from a set that I love, the refractor version. Duh. And so I really dig these because, I've talked about this before, the, the off-white borders on these super fractors, the super fractor doesn't go to the all the way to the edge, it's framed by that off-white border. I've always just really dug that about these super fractors, not to mention the set is just amazing, I just totally dig the design. It's a great set. So, there you have it, Trevor May, 2010 Bone Chrome Prospects Super Fractor. I was really glad to get that. It's interesting, I come to the show and I buy stuff that I'm watching on eBay. <laughs> So weird. Uh, okay, so what else is on the list today? Oh, when, when you're a VIP member this year, uh, they give you, this is really cool because um, they did these, I guess, uh, a couple of years in, that I've been, this is my fifth national, a couple of years I've been, and one of the years I wasn't, I hadn't got 2016. They'll produce like a cool card and they'll slab it through PSA and they'll serial it won't be serial numbered but it'll ha it'll be have a print run of some amount. This is a 2019 National Promo Christy Matthewson Fantasy card out of a thousand. Now, it's my understanding there are 2,500 VIP bags, and uh, if these are to the thousand, that means only a thousand of the bags got this card. And 1,500 bags got something else. Maybe another card. I, I don't know. But this is cool. This is really, really cool. I dig stuff like this. Uh, there's the back. But there's a cool front. So one year they did the um, Black Swamp Find cards like this. They gave you like five of them uh, in 2012. So I had a stack of these in 2012 in my VIP bag. I actually saw one of those cards in one of the Boots like $8 bargain boxes. I didn't buy it because I already have it, but it reminded me of 2012. 2016, they did the Ty Cobb Lucky 7 Find reproductions, and they did something similar. Um, and then I think that caps off the stuff that I'm aware of that I've been either a part of or I've followed up with later on. Uh, I'm sure maybe they've done it before with other things, but kind of cool. I like that. That's fun. I'm a fan. And then uh, the stuff that I got today that's like the... Uh, oh, 
the junk wax era and 90s inserts stuff that I end up buying. So 90s inserts were, I would say slim, but uh, I'm pretty picky because I mean, I can't get it all. I'm not gonna stand there and buy 98 studio press proofs and blow all my money on those. I'm just gonna try to find some more of the higher end pieces. But now while these aren't 90s, these are 2001 Donner's Elite status, uh, four commons I got. So this one's number 21. Uh, that's a, I mean, who cares? <laughs> that's number to 21. I got one number to 25, number to 66, 77, 74. Uh, so the, here, here are the three, or four rather. These were in a dollar, dollar box. Actually, um, I think they were in a $2 box. And I was like, well, I picked out a stack and I offered him a number. He didn't even bother going through the stack. He's like, yeah, sure. So I just handed over the cash and these were in it. So I, I took these as a, a, about a dollar or less. I really like this set because these are shaped as S's for status. The card shape itself. I've always liked that. Aspirations from the set are shaped like A's. They're really cool. Um, let's see. Uh, this one's cool. I picked up this as the 96 Leaf MVP gold version for Piazza. These were throw-ins from a bulk deal that I bought. This is the, I think it's 94 Editor's Choice Studio, Mike Piazza. I've always liked those cards. It's not high-end, but whatever. I, I think they're cool. I dig them. So this is the 95 Select Certified, the, the non-mirror of the Ripken 2131 card. I didn't have the non-mirror, and this was a throw-in, so I figured I'd just grab it. And then, um, junk wax stuff. I won't bore you with this, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 the junk wax cards that I grabbed, but let me see if there's anything else in here I can talk about that's interesting. Oh, here we go. You guys might like these. All right, so... Let's see. Picked up a Bowman's Best 97 International Atomic Wan Gone. I've always loved these. So cool. And so affordable. They're, they're because they printed these like in volumes, so they're available. I picked up this 98 Bowman Chrome Roy Halliday International Refractor. Not a rookie card, but I don't care. I like this. And actually, this is a set that I'm casually building. And I figured, why not get this card? It's just, you know, it's a good card to have. I picked up two uh, from Topps Chrome, Bowman Chrome 2010 Topps 100 Gold Refractors. I've decided to casually work on this set. Both of these guys are named Alex, coincidentally. So those are, those are all numbered to 50. I have um, the Jason Hayward, and I don't remember what else. I think that's the only one I have, actually. So these are cool. You'll dig these. This is the, let's see what this is. 97, right. Donner's Preferred Exponential Power, Roberto Alomar. I dig these. These are really cool plastic, and then they're shaped. Really cool die cut shape. They go one of which way. There's Some players have them one way, other players have them another way. So as I was saying that I got um, two of these Donner's Preferred Exponential Powers. This is the Albert Bell. And I grabbed the Roberto Alomar. Two different booths. So, doubles of Thomas stuff that I already own, but they're strange variations. This is 1994 Pinnacle Museum, but it's like a really off color. Some of these museums didn't age well. This is one of them. Figured this would be a nice add to my doubles archive. And then the um, another uh, foil color print variation of the 94 uh, Bowman preview. Now, the, the colors, you'll notice from top to bottom, they go from different colors. This one's from like an off orange to like almost like a shell pink. So I haven't seen that variation before. I have a bunch of different color variations of these. I don't, it's probably limitless um, because of the way the print was laid out. I got four more of these. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I don't, I'm not chasing these at the show because I don't have a checklist with me and they they range from like a dollar to two bucks or whatever and I just don't think I, they're more than a buck. 
couple more of these 94 Stadium Club First Day issues. It's just a set that I casually work on as time and money permits, but it's not high priority by any means. I picked up another one of these. These are great. I love these. These are 95 Leaf heading for the hall. Frank Thomas. This was two bucks. I just love this set so much. I already have this. I have a couple of them, so this will be a doubles archive find. Dig that. <laughs> oh, man. So, uh, when I got to this booth that was selling, um, I had a whole, like, dollar, 50 cent to a dollar run. This was the first card I saw and I pulled it out. I was like, I'm totally getting this. This is a mint shape, perfectly centered, maybe the best centered copy ever made of the 1978 Topps Nolan Ryan card. Look at that centering. So good, you can see the cut marks on the left side. Yeah. Yeah, I'm expecting to get a 10 centering on this for sure in the subgrade. So I grabbed that. I love this card. Back in 94, I used to live in Fairfax, Virginia, just for that 94, 95 year. And uh, I had this friend in KC who I met in sixth grade. And I'd go to his house. He lived just kind of up the street from me and the, the, this next street over. And his older brother had really nice uh, sports cards in his room. And I asked his brother if he would let me buy, he had this card, he had this 78 Topps Nolan Ryan. And I asked him, I was like, would there be any way for me to buy that off of you? And I, he, he like, we transacted or some, some, in some transaction either gave it to me or I bought it from him. I remember bringing it home and being like, man, that's like so cool, I got that. He also had like a bunch of 86 Topps football, a really cool set. So that was the first, my first interaction with this. And at the time, I think this was like a $30, $35 card. You know, I was going off the book price because this was like pre-eBay. So um, that was, that still to me is, is a, uh, one of the biggest cards I had when I was a kid. Maybe the biggest one I had. I don't remember now, but it was significant. It was a 70s Nolan Ryan, like amazing. And so when I find this card now, I get it. And when I find it in like bargain bins, and I don't care about the condition. Like this one's crazy OC, but it's got a lot of character to it. So uh, that'll just go in my archive. Picked up another Blylevin rookie. I get these when I can find them in the bargain bins. I don't see too many of these now. I saw a bunch of them last year, but I also haven't been pursuing bargain bins as much so far this show. I, I hope to do more of that tomorrow, though. Um, picked up another Brett rookie. Everybody can't get enough of those. And another Dave Winfield. Got a bunch of those at the house. So that is, well, some of my, let me see here. Okay, okay. so I counted up how many um, Greg Maddox rookies I bought today. 35. And they're, this is stack Don Russ, 30 Don Russ and 5 Leaf. I love this card. It's just such a rad picture of Greg Maddox, a real young shot of him. So I picked up this block from one seller. And I think one of these came from another bin somewhere else. So I bought 34 from one seller and one from another guy. So those are cool. And then everything else here that I got was, mm, let's see here. Notable pickups, uh, probably this. 85 Opeachy Ryan Sandberg. I just thought the centering was really nice on this card. And it was in like a, it was in a, a throw-in for a deal that I bought. I paid, I bought a block of stuff from a guy and he, I've bought from this guy many times. He's great. And so I picked that up. An OPG Will Clark rookie. 87 tops. Another throw in. I grabbed a Langston 84. Traded. When I was younger, Langston was, he was a name. And so I, I, I grabbed him. 85 tops Tiffany Langston. I always dig the Tiffany, the fluorescent green backs are just so cool. Big fan of that set. Oh, this is rad. 87 Tiffany, the traded Matt Williams. When I first got this card, the non-Tiffany version, in 94, that year I lived in Fairfax. Um, the card was booked at like a dollar, dollar and a half or something. I just remember being really excited to get the XRC of Matt Williams. Another uh, Joe Carter. Tiffany, 85 tops. Now I've got this card in a 10, both the base and the Tiffany. The base in a 10 is extremely hard to find. It took me years to get mine. 
Uh, other things that I acquired that I totally dig. Uh, I got three more of the Molitors. Okay. I picked up three more Aussies. Can't get enough of those. It's one of my favorites from the 70s. All right. Picked up one more Jim Palmer. Okay, that's a 60s car. That's a 66. I like the 66 design. So I go, I go far back. I'm still missing some rookies in the 60s era, but we'll get there. Picked up another Fleer. Gwen rookie. Always, always love those. Uh, and Ripkins. Can't get enough Ripkins. I got, um, obviously, one of the Don Russ. Uh, one of the Tops. Okay, and got a, <laughs> the other one, right? Um, three of the Fleers. So those are great. I'm happy to have those. Uh, that sort of encompasses my acquisitions from day two, one and two, because we discussed the Jeter card. It was the only card I got yesterday. That puts me at current so far with what I've acquired. So yeah, not a, not a huge things. I mean, the, the Jeter SP is the, the milestone, right? But I'm stoked on the, the Super Fractor, the Trevor May, and the Strasburg the Super Fractor. And just all the classics that I get. So it covers it. There's a, so much stuff on the show floor. I'm taking a lot of photos of stuff I never, I, I just don't see often. So there'll be a gallery in the blog post. Scroll down if you're, if you're watching this on the blog. And if you're watching on YouTube, click through and scroll down. You can see all these cool pictures that I've, the stuff I've taken. Let's definitely have a look at those. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, this is Patrick at Radicards.com and uh, I want to talk about what I got today. Today being the Friday, so it's been a good show so far, but my buying strategy has been different. I've uh, been focusing more on placing less emphasis on certain things at the show based on price point investigating. So for example, Griffey rookies in the Junk Wax era, like Bonds and some of the other guys that I collect in that time, um, even Maddox, uh, I won't buy them beyond a certain price point. I'll just put them back. Uh, Fred McGriff, Jose Canseco, those guys too. Uh, and so I see a lot of them being priced higher than what I'm used, used to paying. Now, if I see blocks of them, I might offer a bulk you know, price and then see what I can do. But there have been a lot less opportunities like that this year. I've only seen, I've only had really like two with a possible third and the first one I missed out on the second one I bought and the third one I kind of bought half of the lot so um, I'm just been cherry picking a little bit in the bargain bins not much though so I focused today on just paying more attention to what's been in the showcases and I uh, did a little bit of digging but we're not going to talk too much about all that stuff I'm just going to talk about some specific pieces that I'm real proud of that I acquired today um, so let's get right into it here. First things first is I bought this, uh, you know, I, I already have this card. It's a Thomas card. Uh, Dan pulled me aside and said, hey, right over there, there's a guy selling um, a Leaf Thomas Fractal Matrix. And I'm like, cool, I'll go check it out. And then I, I already had the card. I already knew that I had the card, but I wanted to check it out anyway. So this the sellers had a PSA 9 version. Here it is. I bought it. This is the 1997 Leaf Fractal Matrix Frank Thomas. Now, the word around the campfire on these cards is that it's speculated that the print run is 100, but there's no serial number on the card. I don't know how that speculation came to be. I just heard this around campfire talk, so I'm not sure how accurate that claim is. The sellers who sold this to me were Trading Card Co-op. You can follow them on Twitter at Trading Card Co-op. Great guys, awesome inventory. If you're into the 90s thing, they, they recently acquired a pretty nice 90s collection. And they use our products, the fitted PSA graded card sleeves. So go check them out. Trading Card Co-op. So yeah, I was glad to pick up the Thomas. It's really great. Uh, I really like this card. Like I said, it's my second copy, and um, I'm happy to have it. And, you know, it was, it was affordable. They, these, these are interesting because the price range is... 
like between 11 and 60 bucks. They're like all over the board in that range. And I think it's because Leaf failed to put a, print, uh, a serial number on these cards, which I'm kind of glad they didn't put them on there because they'd make them more pricey in the current market. I just like these cards. I think they're great looking. So that's the 1997 Leaf Fractal Matrix die cut, Frank Thomas, PSA 9. Next on the list is, let me see here what we got. Um, well, there was, there's a booth, uh, dealers that are at the show at the national and they have an entire section of shoe boxes and different sports and broken out by like, um, age and they're all a dollar. That's awesome. The place is run by this group called the singles club. If you made it a chance to get over there this national, I'm sure you had a good time there. If you haven't gotten to the national yet, you haven't seen them, go check them out. They've got a great setup there, all a dollar. So I picked, Terry picked out the, a bunch of cards from the singles club today, and um, I picked that one specific one here. Uh, this was in the dollar bin. This is cool. you like this. This is 2005 Artifacts, the red version, Number to 50, Kurt Schilling. I thought that was rad. He's on the Boston Red Sox. So I thought I thought the uh, the outfit, the uniform, will fit well with the parallel title. So it's a really nice piece. Number to 50. So you can kind of see the shine on those cards. I really dig these. This was in the dollar bin. So I was happy to get that. And speaking of artifacts from 05, I was at this other booth. And I saw this card, and I originally thought it was, um, just from a distance, I, it looked like Albert Pujols, but obviously Pujols' stance is a bit more refined, um, defined. It's like quite a bit more edgy. But I had them pull this card out of showcase because the price was great, and I was like, let me take a look at that card. So he pulls it out, I was like, oh yeah, okay, it's Torrey Hunter. Still a great player, you know, he's a star. You know, he had a, he had a pretty good career. And I, I talked with him, and we haggled for a bit, and I grabbed this. For slightly less than the asking price. This is, again, another 2005 Artifacts. This is the one of one of Torrey Hunter. Whatever the case, I dig this stuff a lot. And I was glad to get it. I really like this set because I think the design is great with that holographic finish on the backgrounds. I mean, 2005, we're getting more into the modern era. Uh, but I think that this is uh, a great set that Upper Deck did, and I was glad to get this in the archive. So there you have it. This is the 2005 Artifacts, one of one parallel of Tory Hunter. Kind of cool. Other things I picked up along the way, just in various bargain bins and things. Uh, well, I found this. This is great. Now, I have this card. It's probably pretty dinged up. 75 Tops Willie Stargell, but this is like the cleanest example I've ever seen of the card. In fact, they're probably going to have this one slab because it's so clean. This was a dollar. And I was like, well, I'm not going to pass that up. It's so nice. I mean, it is it is nice. This card is so nice. And even the back is well-centered. Look at that. Just a great card. So I grabbed that. Um, and all the rest of these were in the, the, the bargain bin. This one was 33 cents. So these are cheap. Uh, this is 97 Ultra Season Crowns, Alex Rodriguez. So this is a very inexpensive set, but it's beautiful. And this was one of the cards I still needed to complete the set, and it was in the dollar bin. Picked up that. All right, so this would be 99 Finest Hank Aaron Award Contenders Refractor, Sammy Sosa. Now, these cards had some steam a couple of years back. They sort of picked up in value for a minute. And I don't know why, but now I'm getting them in dollar bins. I just think they're cool cards. They're just pretty. I picked up another Exponential Power, this time Tim Salmon. I didn't have, hadn't, I didn't have Tim Salmon, so I grabbed that. I always liked Tim Salmon. Picked up a uh, 96 Pinnacle Essence of the Game, Mike Piazza. Love this set. This set's so rad. Underrated. It's pretty. That that like um, holographic on the top, the header there. It's just really cool. I dig that set a lot. Um, I picked up a in the same box. This was 95 Leaf Gold Leaf Stars, Mike Piazza. 
Got that hole punch out star down there on the bottom. These are great. This is a great follow-up to the 94 release. I thought the 94 release, to me, I still think that's the best looking set of all time. 94 Leaf Gold Leaf Stars. They're just so awesome. This is Upper Deck 99 Home Run Highlights. Uh, these are numbered to 600. So those are cool. This was 30, 30, not 33 cents. They were three for a buck. And I just picked out random stuff and just offered the guy, like, I hit him a brick. And I was like, it's seven bucks. He's like, all right. This went in it. I, you know, I just like the, the way these cards look. Something about that pink and that hollow foil that just really works with the design. And JD Drew, because he's a huge prospect. <laughs> um, okay, so these other cards are were grabbed at another booth and um, with some other stuff we won't discuss, but these are the highlights. Uh, this is cool. So I'll go, I don't know. Maybe we'll, we'll start it off with Jason Giambi. How about that? This is 2002 Donruss season stat line, 38 home runs, which means it's a serial number to 38. So those are really cool. Nice, like, reflect, refractive, refractive finish on that. I dig these. It's pretty, pretty nice. Serial number to 38 on this one. Um, $5.00. He didn't want to come down too much on the price, and I was okay paying that for this because well, it's just it, this is one of those cards I wouldn't have looked for otherwise, but I found it, and I was like, well, that's kind of a, that's kind of cool. I like that. I mean, this guy had so much stuff like this, but I couldn't get it all. I didn't want to get it all. I just wanted to cherry pick. You know, I think I bought seven cards out of his. I think it's six thirty six or seven thirty two hundred count boxes, and I bought seven cards. Really good use of my time. <laughs> so this is. Cliff Floyd, 2003 Donner's Champions, oh man, off the top of my head, I don't even, whatever. I have the Thomas like this, there's like a, there's like a, a steel and a hollow steel, or a metal and a hollow metal, and I don't remember, this was the hollow one, they're, they're still numbered to 25. So Cliff Floyd is on the Boston Red Sox here, but this is interesting because in 2002, his stats indicated that he was traded from Florida Mar uh, Marlins to Montreal Expos, Expos to Boston Red Sox. Man, I butchered that. I'm sorry. And then on the front of this card, he says, signed by the Mets on 12-2002. So he had bounced around th four different locations in the span of a year. And what a rough year for Cliff Lloyd. I'm probably the only one in the entire show... <laughs> In 2019 National that has purchased a Cliff Lloyd card. I can't back that up with any degree of certainty, but maybe it's the best Cliff Lloyd card that was acquired. How about that? I don't know. This is cool. So these are numbered to 25. I really like this set a lot. Things start to get pretty hairy in the early 2000s with like the different products that, that came out that time. There's so much stuff that was coming out. This next one is awesome. I mean, these are all really cool, but this one specifically is really, really cool. This is 2005 Topps Black, seal number to 54. This, my friends, is the one and only Tom, a.k.a. Flash Gordon. Okay, you and I, you guys, you remember that back in 99 in Don Russ where they had the Tom Gordon card, the rookie card, and I mean, the, uh, the Royals outfit? And we all collected that in the late 80s. Like, that was one of the rookies to, to try to, you know, file. Obviously, the Griffey. And then you had um, uh, Gary Sheffield and Randy Johnson, um, John Smoltz. Uh, uh, well, you've got the Sosa card in the, bo uh, the baseball's best set. And, um, of course, Edgar Martinez found his way in that run as well for some reason. Of course, he's in the 88 Fleer set. Um, Sandy Alomar Jr., um, just, you know, a lot of names. Oh, Jim Abbott was showcased in Angel, Angel's uniform proper in, in that year. Of course, he's in the 88. Tops traded as a USA. That says XRC. Um, and, you know, Tom Gordon was one of those, along with Greg Olson. You guys remember remember that one? 
So he was one of those guys, those pitchers who was up and coming. And, you know, and so I, when I saw this, I was like, man, I didn't know he played that long. But I'm looking at his stats in the back, and he played with the Royals from 88 to 95, was traded then to the Red Sox uh, from 96 to, to uh, 99, was with the Cubs from 2001 to 2002. So it looks like he skipped the 2000 year. I don't see any stats here at all. And then in 2002, he's traded from the Cubs to the Astros. 2003 to the White Sox, 2004 to the Yankees. So he was shuffled around a bit toward the end of his career. Pretty normal stuff. But this is the Topps Black, number to, serial number to 54. I just thought that was so cool. And it says Flash Gordon. It doesn't even say Tom Gordon anymore. They call him Flash Gordon here. I just thought that was rad. I was stoked to get this because it's, uh, one, it's a rare parallel, right? But two, it's just a great card with an awesome name of a guy I, I used to collect when I was really young. And uh, not heavily, obviously. I just file his cards in with my binder. And that was, that was, those were good times. So he's on the Yankees here, which is interesting. I, I mean, he must have been acquired on a trade, maybe a bulk deal. I don't know. I'd have to look into it. It doesn't, whatever. I just thought that was a cool card to get. Today was fun. You know, I was able to talk to all kinds of people, meet up with people, and, and, and I looked for a booth that I saw on Wednesday. The guy was selling a bunch of vintage sports books and like some old like vintage baseball books. And I wanted to go back and get one or two. So I, I, I walked around, serpentine from the beginning, like the, the front kind of toward the back. I mean, I was walking around the whole place looking for this booth. And I finally found it at around 5.30. And the show closes at six, so I was like, okay. And at the time, he had acquired, he had sold most of the ones I was interested in, so I, I didn't buy any. But I found it. At least I found it. You know, it's the thing about the show is that if you don't buy something that you find that you like, <laughs> I, I talk about this a lot. I've harped on this a few times over the years. Is that if there's any concern. If there's any interest in something at all and it's really well within your budget, just buy it. Just buy it. Don't worry about it. You know, and just you just walk and, and you, you might you might come across something else and you might not, but you, you can rest in the fact that you, you made a good deal. And um, if you don't buy it, just accept that it's probably not going to be there the next time you come back. And that's has happened to me a couple of times at this show. There was a brick of some junk, some puckets and Maddox's and Griffey's that I, I was gonna buy, but we couldn't really agree on a price. We were too far apart. And so I was like, said, you know, just set them down. I'll come back later. I came back later and they were all sold. I was like, oh crap. So I guess the, you know, I came back so many hours later that they put them back out and they were purchased. But when I got back, I saw a stack of Maddox's and I grabbed those. So that was, that made up for it to some degree. But I realized like, you know, trying to focus more on quant, quality over quantity. I mean, I did pick up some great, like, artist proofs and things today, but um, if I'm not careful, I'd just come home with a lot of that stuff, and I, I'd really rather, you know, put more money toward some of the higher-end pieces, because that stuff is available. Um, and so, this something I, th I, I talk about is, you know, I go to the National to try to find stuff I couldn't otherwise find on eBay very easily. Uh, and, and so, trying to place more emphasis on that, that strategy, that style, of, of, of buying and just because I think that um, my, my outcome is going to be, um, I think I'll feel better about it. I mean, I've, I've had no regrets on the stuff I've purchased. I've always enjoyed getting the stars and the classics, the stuff I've always loved that I grew up I, you know, hoping that I'd ever own. But I have so much of that stuff now that I'm thinking, well, how much more do I need and how much more time do I got to spend at the National trying to get more of that stuff when I can go on eBay and buy bricks of most of that stuff for, you know, some amount of money that's not not too terrible. So I might spend more money on eBay getting lots of those, but I'll save a lot more time at the National, and it, which is a show that exists in one week that I look forward to all year long. So now I'm thinking, well, yeah, I've always wanted a Gretzky rookie, okay? You know... I have, okay, there are four different cards, and you can maybe comment below uh, which one of these you think would be the better investment. Um, Gretzky rookie tops right now, okay, OPG is like twice as much, it's a big, it's a big buys. Tops, Gretzky rookie, a mid-tier LeBron James rookie, All right, we're talking like tops contemporary, 
like that mid tier. Um, Tom Brady rookie, also mid tier. There, there's an abundance of stuff that I could get there, right? Uh, and or a Trout 2011 Bowman Chrome parallel, like a refractor or a colored refractor, probably purple. So which of those four do you think is a better investment? Comment below. So those are the four cards I'm thinking like, well, if I want to buy one and then call it for the show, let's say it's like Sunday evening, like 2, 3, 4 p.m. where the show closes at 5. I was talking to Dan about this today. I was like, Dan, amongst, among those four cards, you know, which of the four would you get? He's like, well, I've always had it. I'm biased. I've always won. I've always liked the Gretzky rookie, so I'd always go to the Gretzky rookie. And so he and I were like, looking at end prices on eBay where they're where they're going and um, they're affordable in sixes a six six to eight that would be my range in the tops I wouldn't go to a nine I mean the jump is so big from eight to a nine we're looking at you know eleven hundred bucks to nine thousand dollars that's just too far apart between an eight and a six is between like it's like four or five hundred bucks I mean it's, it's not that big of a difference so I'm, I, I'd be happy with a six if the condition was really cherry, like really great centering, clean. Um, that's I'd be completely happy with a six and just call it a day. But because the difference between a six and an eight is not that big a deal, I'd be happy with an eight. Now, granted, if I go back into baseball and you know I'm not looking at just Trout, Nolan Ryan rookie would be the other one that I would look at. Just the tops because this, that card comes in four different flavors. You got tops, so peachy. Milton Bradley, Venezuelan. Obviously, Venezuelan is going to be the bigger, huge one. Opeach is going to be pretty big. Milton Bradley, obviously more expensive than Tops. Tops being that's abundant. So, you know, I'm up against the kind of like, it's not like a battle by any means, but it's just I'm looking at that stuff more now as opposed to looking how many more Greg Maddox rookies I can get in my collection because I have hundreds already. And I'm happy to get more. I love that. I love those cards. The Fleers, I remember last year... Um, I was, I actually brought my mom to the National last year because I wanted her to see it at least one time. She really enjoyed it, but I remember at Sunday night I looked at my binder, which I didn't bring this here, I brought a single row box, and I had like seven pages of the Fleer, <laughs> the 87 Fleer update Maddox, seven full pages of them. And so I have, I have quite a few copies of that card, and that was just the Maddox, not to mention the Gwyns and the Ripkins and the Boggs and Sandbergs and the Mattingleys and Maguires that I was buying. So um, I just really like that era. I mean, I just do. And so I now have to focus on, you know, I, I'd like to focus on just some, some higher end pieces. I think is because you have just a limited amount of time, you've only got five days. Well, really, it's four and a half days because the Wednesday is just a four hour session, right? 4 to 8 p.m. Really, it's 3.30 to 8, so you get four and a half hours. But whatever the case is, it's not a full day. So you have to kind of plan for that and figure out how you want to use that time. Um, I walked around today and, and just kind of like looked more at Showcase, took more pictures. I got a great gallery um, on, on, the, on the blog post here. Just look, click through to the blog post if you're on YouTube. And if you're on the blog already, just scroll down. I took a picture of the menu. <laughs> Uh, that you could where you could buy hot dogs. You get this. These prices are crazy. Yeah. Okay. Get this. This is interesting. You get one hot dog and fries. It's ten ninety nine. Two hot dogs and fries. Fifteen ninety nine. Cheddar burger and fries. Thirteen ninety nine. Oh, you'll love this one. Save the best for last, right? Two slices of pizza and large fountain drink. $23.99. This is why I talked uh, previously about going to Costco, making your snack packs, throwing a couple snack packs in your backpack the night before so you don't forget them, um, and then going to the grocery store the night of the first day, getting groceries for the week, because these prices are more than a third of what I paid for my entire week's groceries. This big one, this $23.99 one. I mean, the margins on this stuff are astronomical they are big and so I just was like dodge this go run an errand knock this stuff out save your dollar bills for the card convention so I found 
One dealer that I've bought from before many times, and even I, I think I bought from him in person for the first time at the 2015 National, he was there, and he had 1998 Bowman Chrome Golden Anniversary Refractor, Mark McGuire, and I was like, Dan, you gotta get over here and check this card out, it's huge. It's number five, it's a big card, and um, Dan was interested, but it's, it's so, it, it's expensive, it's an expensive card. And so I got to talking about this with a seller about like, you know, um, have you been aware of the varying, the, 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 the questionable versions of these cards? You know, there's, there's talk in the hobby that, that some of them were aftermarket printed and you can tell by the different fonts. Um, and so we talked about that for a minute. This one was slabbed, it's been authenticated, so that one seems to be legitimate. But I, I just rarely see those. I mean, they, they pop sometimes. I've got a Travis Lee. I paid like 30 bucks for it at auction, which I thought was high for a Lee card, but it is something that said collectors might be into. Although I don't know why you'd want to build a set that's so incredibly elusive. Uh, it's like building a set of super fractors. It's like impossible. Of course, print run of five is more than a print run of one, so it's not impossible. It's just highly improbable is what I'll say. But I had a good time going through some of the bins today and pulling out some stuff. I got some like low-end 90s insert things like I said some of the artist proofs and things that I, I grabbed um, pretty good day so far it's been a good show you know I, I think that by day four you know you've seen at least the way my strategy is because it's my fifth national now um, I serpentine and I pay attention to what's where and the actual the show at the, the Chicago show is is longer this year Dan was telling me that they opened up a whole extra room with like red carpet I didn't know I thought that was like always the national convention show room but he was telling me that, that section they've opened up it's like a new area um, and so I guess there was a partition in front of it and they just opened that partition up and then and, and um, sold out those spaces to dealers it's a really big hall I like the Chicago venue a lot so, great day today. Thank you for tuning in to the Dialogue on the Friday Purchases. junk wax stuff today trying to make up for the loss that I had on Wednesday when I set a stack back and then went back and it was it was sold so I bought dollar bin stuff two dollar stuff bought a whole bunch of a stack of Barry Bonds 87 Donruss this time a stack of 86 Donruss Fred McGriffs really good deals though overall and there's just so much to see that I can't see it all. So I've just accepted that I won't be able to see it all, but that's okay because you know, I'm having a good time looking at all the different things these guys have. A lot of modern Bowman Chrome autographs. It's pretty standard. Tons of vintage this show. Tons of it. Um, and a lot less junk wax rookies than, I've, than, than last shows. So much, so much fewer. Which is fine because, well, keeps me, keeps me from overspending. What's up? This is a review of the uh, Saturday. Um, day of the 2019 National Sports Collection Convention. Um, I run in, well I think I ran in yesterday actually, I just walked in today. Uh, Dan got there early. Um, so I just kind of been rooting around more to like make up for <laughs> some of my losses this year for um, negotiating down some junk wax rookie cards. Uh, but I was able to, I, I was Able to grab some stuff today to add to my archive in that way. Um, what else? So, um, I've noticed in this show is that 
Negotiating has been kind of difficult. You know, sellers will negotiate down a small percentage. So for example, if something tallies out to be 30 bucks, I might be able to get it for 25. Instead of saying, well, how about 20? And it's just been difficult to get them, get the sellers down um, for a, in a lot of ways. One guy wanted 25 for a stack of like three cards. I said, how about 15? He's like, no, I'm 25. And I sat there and explained to him that one of the cards wasn't worth more than you know X dollar figure and he was overvaluing it. And I said, well, what about 20? He's like, that's fine. I still think at 20 it was too much, but there were two cards in there that are really rare that I already had, but I never see them, and I figured I'd just get doubles of them. Um, it's been like that a lot of the show. It's been a great show, though. I mean, I've had a good time, got a lot of great items, and I want to discuss a few of the pieces that I got today. Not obvi obviously not everything, because I, I, a lot of the stuff is just um, not really talking point worthy, but the, some, the stuff that we are going to discuss today is really cool, so I can't wait to share it with you. You know, I talk about dollar bin experiences is that when I'm digging through a dollar bin, I kind of like to do it fast. Actually, I don't kind of like, I very much love to do it fast. I have a strategy where I can blast through eight 3,200 count boxes um, in less than 40 minutes. And so I, 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 what I do is I grab a whole block and I let them fall from my left hand into my right hand. I don't even sift through it. I just let them fall. And if I see something that I recognize, I'll pull it out and I can blast through a full row in less than a minute and so it's 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 been interesting to do that in big large blocks of dollar bins and I've only really been going through baseball at all I don't even actually I could say that with confidence I've only been going through baseball and if there's something in a stack that's multi-sport I might see something in another sport that I like like today I bought a Ken Dryden rookie card because it was in with a stack of baseball and there was like a Ricky Henderson rookie card that I bought and a couple of Griffey rookies, and so I, I, I and Dennis Eckersley rookies. So I, there's every now and then I'll see something that I know is valuable in another sport, and I'll grab it at the right price if it makes sense. And so uh, there was a dollar bin today. Well, two of them. One of them I was working on for about 30, 40 minutes, and I pulled out like 12 cards. And I was like, well, I don't. The return on the investment isn't large, but the 12 cards I got were actually really cool. Um, and so we'll talk about some of them. Uh, and then another bin was on the way out. There were like five minutes left in the show. It's 5.55. Show closes at 6. And Dan, I get a hold of Dan, and Dan's like, hey, there's this box you got to check out. I stored some Thomases in there. Uh, when I was going through it, I just pulled them all out and put them in the back. I did that for him with McGuire yesterday. And this morning when we went in, I showed him where that box was. And I just pulled the cards out and just gave him the brick. I was like, here you go, um, because I wanted him to go through them. Uh, because I know he collects McGuire, I wanted to, you know, to uh, do that for him. He did that for me today um, at the end of the day. And I had all the Thomases, but I, I cherry-picked a couple of fun ones that were doubles that I liked. I just like certain certain cards that I dig. So grab those. Oh, there was like a Donruss Optic Orange Parallel I didn't have, so I grabbed that. But um, and I think a Prism from this year, and that's not a... That's, usually I do Prism. Didn't do it this year because it's it's really exhausting. They used to be pretty manageable. Now they're just, it's crazy. So I, I kind of just like to watch the auctions and they're fine, but I, I grabbed one or two of the different parallels since I've been at the show. But um, there was a gentleman who was, he had his things laid out on the table. So and he was pretty focused on what he was doing. I wouldn't bother him. Uh, and there were two other boxes, uh, 3,200 counts. And um, so I just kind of like sifted through with my hands at uh, like on the side, like they were this way, the odd way. And so I was kind of like digging through a little bit that way. I only had five minutes. They were going to kick us out. So I was like, well, I'm going to see what I can find. Didn't find anything in, the, in that way, but you know, whatever. And I just grabbed the four cards. And while I was on my way out, I grabbed a um, 92 Topps Gold Shack Rookie in SGC 85. I didn't really care the grade. It was in the $5 bin. I was like, well, I'm going to grab this, you know? So this will be good to have. I thought this would be nice to have. Uh, I, I have another one of these and um, a raw one I got some years ago, I think at the at one of the nationals. I don't remember which one, maybe 17. And I remember the gentleman thinking, uh, that it was a big card in 92, and it certainly was, you know, I know that that being the parallel, and they were, uh, at least in baseball, they were, the golds were one a box, so they were hard to pull, 
But then when we released the whole entire set form, I remember it was like diffused my interest in wanting to put together the Topps Gold set because I could just go buy the gold box, the actual full complete set with the Brian Taylor gold autograph in it. So cool. So I wrapped around the back. They opened up a partition this year in the National, the, the Chicago show. And they opened up a partition that had a whole extra room on one of the sides. And that was full of dealers. I mean, this convention is the probably, the, I don't know if it's the biggest one, but it seems like the biggest the hall I've ever been in with that extra additional room. And so um, they, I, I, I spent some time up there today looking around because I really kind of browsed through on Monday and, or Wednesday and Thursday fast uh, just to get a feel for what was what and if there was anything I needed to grab. I was just on a mission to get the SP Jeter, which is done. And um, while I was up there, I found two cards that we're going to discuss today. Now, in 2010, as you know, the uh, Bowman Prospect Strasburg, that was the card everybody was chasing back then, the paper and the chrome. They were big, hot, super hot cards. And I remember the orange and the blue seeing them at, like, Frankenson back in, in California, rarely. And raw ones were, like, you know, 40, 50 bucks. And the graded ones were uh, obviously up in the three figures, depending on the grade. I rarely saw blue. I saw an orange one time. And so today... A gentleman had um, the finest gold refractor redemptionist showcase, which I have a PSA 9. I'm happy with it. Um, but I wanted to look and see what was underneath because it looked like it was in a stack. Um, and I said, Are there other, other Strasburgs underneath? He's like, Yeah. So he pulls them out. And I pick up the, there was underneath was the BGS 95 of the 2010 Bowman Pros Prospects orange parallel of Steven Strasburg and I was like wow that's really cool because the orange goes all the way to the edge so you have a lot so you have the high susceptibility to flaking and chipping and corner damage and all this so I looked at it and you see priced it at 40 and I was like is there any room he's like well I'd like to get 25 and I was like okay so I kind of go walk around a little bit for I don't know half an hour maybe less and I tried to get a hold of Dan to get his feedback on it. Couldn't reach him, so I just made the executive. First, I was like, well, let's check the pop report on the BGS95 orange papers. I couldn't log in because my password was changed. I changed it like two weeks ago, and I didn't update it on my phone. And so, and it, I guess, well, I, I really, I didn't, it doesn't auto, it didn't update on my browser. So on my phone, I went to log in. I had my old password auto-logged in, auto-locked. And, um... So I couldn't log in. I wanted to see if, what the pop is on 9.5s for orange paper Strasburgs. So I was like, you know what? I'm not going to fuss over this. If I'm already thinking about it, I'm just going to go buy it. Because I know if I don't buy it, I'm going to come home tonight and wish that I'd gotten it. And then I'm going to go back tomorrow, and it's going to be sold. That's been, my, <laughs> that's been the story of my life at this show. I had it on day one. There was a brick of the junk wax cards that I wanted. It was uh, Griffey's, Maddox, and Puckett's. A bunch of them. Uh, it was like 125, or 125, it was pretty it was a good deal, and I should have bought it, but whatever, I mean, th there's no shortage of those, I can just go on eBay and buy a brick of them that way, that's fine, I just, you know, National's a good time to buy these things, because they're, they're you can find them, at least I used to be able to find them in bulk for cheap, this National, they've been really sparse, and when I do find them, the asking prices are quite a bit more than I'm used to paying, so I've, I'm coming home with a lot less of it this year, which is fine, but because of that, that was the first instance, there was another instance today where I, I, I've, been, I've been looking for a 2001 Topps Chrome Retrofractor Ichiro rookie card. Eventually I'll have one. I plan to have one between now and the summertime next summer, so a year from now. Um, gentleman had a PSA 9, and he wanted 550, and I was like, well, that's, that's high, but I know that card will jump. I know the card has huge potential to be, be huge, be big, uh, and really grow. Um, and so I was like, well... I told the seller, I was like, let me, let, me, let me think on it. I might come back. I might not, but let me think on it. And he's like, okay, no problem. So I came back about an hour later, and it was sold. It was gone. Well, it was gone out of the showcase, so I just assumed he sold it. I was like, man, that would have been nice to have. <laughs> but I know I'll get one. It's not serial number. They're just rare. I, just, I don't see them that frequently. They're just, they're just rare. So I'm confident I'll have one in the collection within a year. Um, but, but I did get, I walked around the other guy's booth, and um, it was in this kind of the same area, this red carpet area, and I did pick up the 
uh, Bowman Paper 2010 Bowman Prospects. Orange or orange parallel to the Strasburg rookie card. Well, it's the prospect card. The famous one with that iconic photo. I like this. Like I said, the orange borders, you have you know, a potential for, like, corner wear and whatever. I mean, to its credit, the corners did get 9. Everything else got 9.5. So uh, this is just a tough card to grade high. The, the colored borders with the blue. I picked up a blue 8 earlier this year, and it was, like, 9 bucks or 11 bucks. It was cheap. And so this will go with it. It's the, it was a PSA 8. Uh, this will go nicely next to it as the, the other version of the card that's, that's the low parallel. These are cool. I dig these. This is just such a great card to have. And uh, it's really not, it's under the radar now because it's nine years past its release date. But I really like this. This is cool. So grab that for 25 I thought that was a good deal. So I wanted to get that guy, obviously. So I got that in the, the collection now. This other card is really cool and I can't wait to share it with you. It's so rad. So rad. Maybe one of the best purchases I've made ever. <laughs> and that's, that's saying a lot. I mean, it's not the best. It's just one of the best. I'd say somewhere in the top 100. Okay, and I've made a lot of purchases. This is top 100 stuff. So there's another gentleman that uh, was, was uh, uh, like in that area, that red carpet area. And he had a lot of really nice vintage. He had a whole like like fanned out row of um, 54 tops Al Al line rookies PSA. Really nice stuff. Mid grade. He had a whole half a showcase of Gretzky rookies top, uh, tops mostly, and some Opeaches on the bottom. Uh, he had a bunch of a whole bunch of Nolan Ryan rookies. All, everything's great at PSA. A couple of Willie Mays rookies, 51 Bowmans. Bunch of mantles. Bunch of mantles. So I was looking at his showcase, taking a closer look, and I saw something. I was like, wow, that's... Let me take a look at that card. I took a picture of it. I've been taking a lot of photos, by the way. The gallery in this blog post down below, uh, if you're on YouTube, like I said, click through. Uh, if you're on the blog post, just scroll down. There's lots of awesome content there for you to check out. All the stuff I shot while I was there just because it's interesting, and I might never see it again. So uh, have a look at that. So this, the image of this card is in there. Now, um... I picked up, when I was 30, when I turned 32, I bought myself, no, my 33rd birthday, I think it was, yeah, I bought myself a, a, a Mickey Mantle card. I was like, well, I'm going to get a Mickey Mantle. So I bought myself a 54 Bowman, uh, PSA 1. It's got tape residue on the top and bottom, but it's got great eye appeal, awesome center. Good card. So today when I looked at this guy's showcase, I saw another Mantle that I was curious to look, look closer at. And so he pulled it out and I took a look at it. And um, he and I negotiated for it, and I bought it. Okay? Now, I bought this example. is a 53 Bowman Color Mickey Mantle. It's beautiful. It's got great eye appeal. No, no creases. No rounded corners. Corners are sharp. The, the, the picture quality is excellent. It's just a gorgeous card. A little off-center, top to bottom. There's only one problem with this thing. Okay. It's got hole punches through it. Like someone put it through a Rolodex and just left it there without even looking at it. Top up there, that's top too. This thing is so beautiful. Even with those holes, this thing is just gorgeous. So if, you know, you got pinholes, these are gigantic holes. Pinholes do that too. They make cards affordable with great eye appeal. And so um, this one's got just awesome color. It looks brand new. I mean, it really looks like it came out of the pack. You know, it's just been worn a little bit, but just very touched. It's, maybe it's a grade like a five it had it not had these holes. I mean, it's that it's that nice. It is, it is really nice. I mean, centering is not great. Obviously, you can see there. Um, even the back centering is just not that good. But the front and the front centering, again, not that great. But, man, this is just such a cool ad. You know, I wanted to get something vintage. Every year that I come to Nationals, I was like, well, I want to get something vintage. It's not anything. It doesn't have to be high quality. Like I said, I got Hoyt Wilhelm one year. It was like 6 bucks. This year I picked up 53 Bowman Color Mickey Mantle. Um, this, this qualifies as my vintage purchase. And then this year I also decided to get... Modern, which we discussed in an earlier segment of this video. So, 
I just really dig this kind of thing. This, you know, this allows me to get a really excellent Mickey Mantle card with awesome eye appeal, even though it's got the, the hole punches in it. I mean, who wouldn't love that card? You know, I took a photo of it because I was like, this has to go in the gallery. Then I was thinking, why don't I just buy the thing? I initially offered 100. He asked 200. I was initially after 100. He said, I can't go that low. He's like, I do 175. I was like, well, could you do 150? And he's like, unfortunately, I can't. He and I got to talking about, you know, reminiscing about classics and things. And he's like, I can tell you what, 170. I was like, okay, that's, I can do that. Now, I had, like I said, uh, I think I said this earlier is that in, in this video is that um, I've been thinking about one of a couple different cards, you know, Brady or LeBron mid-tier, uh, Gretzky rookie, a Trout rookie that's a Bowman Chrome refractor color, or um, 2001 Topps Chrome retro refractor each year. They're all in the same sort of bracket, four to six hundred bucks. But now that I bought this mantle and the other pieces I've acquired, I, I, I think I'm set. Like, I don't think I need to buy another big card. Um, those cards are available. I can get them. Uh, they're going up a lot of them. They all have great potential to continue rising. So those are all very strong cards. But when I saw this 53 Bowman Mantle, I was like, I was done. I was like, I'm just going to grab that. That to me is, um, that this card to me is, is a prize in my collection just because it's so rad. Tons of story behind it. Lots of talking conversation potential. You know, people can talk about um, obviously anything Mickey Mantle's career, anything vintage baseball, anything Yankees. I just really dig this card. And I love, I, just, I even love that it has the whole, the, the, the whole punches through it. And I was thinking like, this has to be a Rolodex because I don't know any binders who, that have holes that close together. You know? So this is really great. I mean, it's just so clean. And I can handle the holes. And I'm okay with that. I just think that's so rad. The gentleman also had a 54 Bowman slabbed authentic by BGS. And it was the, the person who owned it cut out all the sides. So it was a square and all you saw was Mantle's portrait. And it was missing a good chunk of the card. And I was like, that's, that's kind of cool, right? And so I didn't want to buy it. But I was like, if you were to ask... You know, I didn't have price. I was like, if you were to ask a value, put a dollar figure on this word, you put, he's like, about a hundred bucks. I was like, you think you'll get that? He's like, yeah, eventually I'll sell it. And I'm like, yeah, that's really amazing that you, you know, I, I wouldn't buy it for a hundred. But then again, I also got a card that's missing and some dimples. And so I was like, well, um, I'd rather have that card just because it's got, it's, it's got the frame, the whole, the majority of the card with a couple pull, holes in it. It's just a better looking card to me. But it was really great to see the 54 Bowman um, uh, with, with missing, you know, a good chunk of the card. So I got those three. Those are my three graded pickups today. Uh, I haven't done a lot of graded since I've been here, but these other three cards, I want to grab some raws, three raws, three graded, three raws to right now. Uh, these guys are really cool. So, uh, gentleman I bought from previously a couple nationals now. I've known him now, I guess for like four years. Good dude. He's got a great selection. Awesome prices. Good personality. Just a great guy. And uh, I found this card in uh, one of his bargain bins. I think they were like two or three bucks a card. Um, so in 2002, the Chicago Sun-Times released a run of cards for, I believe it was either like a show or something, something that was proprietary, like something that happened, like an event. Cards were released. I have some Thomases like this, but this is the, one of the Cliff, Cliff Floyds. Now that my second Cliff Floyd at the National, I'm probably the only one who has purchased any Cliff Lloyds this entire show. Yay for me. So I should think Cliff Lloyd's a pretty rad dude myself. Uh, he's in, he's a, he does a little bit of like, he works with one of the big broadcasting networks for sports. And I, I just, uh, I remember him being a hot shot in the early nineties. So I kind of have some memories of this guy. So this one is, um, the Chicago Sun Times collection, uh, serial number three of five. They all printed five copies. Now you'll notice the logo on the left hand side of the card, kind of see it there in silver. Okay, so those were printed on the ones that were released at this, for this particular campaign. Now I don't know if it was an event or if it was done through, uh, through or to uh, promote 
their brand through cards. I don't know the specifics of it uh, entirely. All I know is that uh, a lot of cards were released and they were all serial numbered to five copies. I have a bunch of the Thomas cards um, and this guy had a bunch of commons and then he had Cliff Floyd and I was like, well, I'm going to grab Cliff Floyd. I think it's you know cool that these exist and I haven't seen a Cliff Floyd like this before. So I wanted to grab it. So this is the 2001 Don Russ that was stamped with the 2002 Chicago Sun Times collection serial numbering with logo. Just kind of cool, obscure stuff that you just don't see every day. So I grabbed that. And these two were dollar bin stuff. And I, I this was the, the mess of eight 3,200 count boxes that I rifled through really quickly. And I found, I went through most of the stuff I wasn't interested in, but I found a 1983 Fleer Gwyn. But look at the centering on that one. <laughs> it's just horrendous. I like that card a lot. I have a bunch of these. Let's grab that. And then uh, this is the last one that I, I wanted to discuss. 77 Tops Bruce Sutter rookie card with really awful cut. Top to bottom. Really cool. I also picked up a 68 Stargell that's got a similar fix. It's so bad that you can see parts of the other card up here and parts of his card down here. So it looks like he's like uh, the image is, is uh, centered. In fact, let me see if I can pull it out here for you. You can see it. Uh, all in all, it was a fun day today. Oh, this was cool. This I picked this up in the dollar bin too. It's 76 Nolan Ryan. I mean, it's chewed out, but... That's that's always a good card to get. I've got a bunch of these now. I got a lot of hammered ones of these. I guess the 76 Tops Ryans were enjoyed immensely by that generation. <sighs> Let's see here. Where is it? Oh, yes. This is it here. So this is my 68 Stargell Nis cut. You can see it's kind of like the frame that the image is like centered in the card. Obviously not supposed to. So grab those. A bunch of other things too. Just miscellaneous stuff that I dig. Most of it's, all of it's stuff I collect. Um, yeah, I mean, I had a good time. It's, it's, been, it's been a fun show. I mean, there, it's always fun. It's not an issue of, of, of entertainment value by any means. I'm always enjoying myself at these shows. Um, I've just found that it, there's, quite, there's quite a bit less junk wax stuff this year last year and the uh, year before and 2015 i bought a lot of it oh, hundreds of cards in the 70s through 80s years i stop at 87 and only in 87 is bonds and then i only anybody after 87 is 89 with griffey stuff i don't really do anything else like, I love Glavins and Smoltz and Randy Johnsons and Craig Biggio's and Roberto Alomar's, but that stuff to me is really low value, and um, not it does it's not worth it to me to acquire that stuff in bulk because of how low value. Even Chipper Jones to me is, and Jeff Bagwell are just not high value enough for me to, to hoard. So I try, I stick with, usually it's like, um, obviously, you know, the big ones from the 80s, right? Henderson... Uh, Ripken, Bog, Sandberg, Gwynn, Mattingly, Puckett, Clemens, McGuire, 85 McGuire, I don't do 87 stuff, um, 86 Consecos and McGriffs, um, 87 Bonds, 87 uh, uh, Maddox, and 89 Griffies. That encompasses my 80s stuff. And, um, I picked up a few Lee Smiths in like dollar and fifty cent boxes, mostly Fleer and Don Russ. Didn't see any uh, raw tops of Lee Smith. His stuff really popped because of the Hall of Fame. I mean, I could have gotten his ten in a tops card like years ago for like way less than like fifty bucks. Now they're like eight ninety. I mean, it's crazy how expensive they are now because of that. That's pretty typical stuff, run of the mill type of behavior in terms of. Uh, when when any player makes the news, it's like let's go out and get every rookie card, or let's get the highest grade. Then the the, the values blow up on us. That's what I'm predicting as we're going to see again with the SP Jeter stuff, or Lane Jeter stuff, um, uh, in, in this coming year. So that's going to be it's going to be fascinating to kind of watch that. And I'm glad I got the SP Jeter out of my 
I'm uh, done. Uh, now I gotta get the Stadium Club Dome card. That's one I want to grab to get that out of the way. That's the other one, but that's a, like a lower popularity card, but it's still going to have a lot of growth potential. So, obviously, I bought more than what we discussed, but those are the three. Pe those are the six or a couple pieces or whatever, six plus pieces that I, I wanted to share with you tonight. Um, thanks for watching. Thank you for tuning in. It's the, uh, the last day of the show, and it's pretty typical. They've got a lot of dealers packing up and getting ready to leave. So when I first witnessed this in 2012, I can remember being kind of upset by it because I felt like one of my days was like not at full capacity of dealers, you know. And then so there was just a lot less stuff to see because. Dealers would be packing up and leaving like halfway through the halfway through the day. Right now there are a bunch of empty tables and um, still a lot of people here. But you can tell that stuff's thinning out. Dealers are thinning out, and it's uh, it's afternoon right now. Um, so still a lot to be had here. Still a pretty good chunk of the day left which is great. I've been pretty picky and I've realized at this show that uh, I've grown as a collector over the last seven years since my first national in 2012. I, uh, I'm really, really picky and I came here with more money than I needed just in case, which was great. I don't even have enough time to spend it all. Uh, on stuff that I actually want. And I'm really now real picky with price points. If it's not in my price bracket, even though I have money to buy it, I, I'll walk. I've done that a lot this year. And it feels good. But I mean, he's okay. You know what I'm saying? Because then I know I'm paying what I want, need to pay for or want to pay for a card. And so it's it's been, it's been nice to have that. But I'm buying less because of it. I'm bringing home less stuff because of it. Which is also fine. So it's been a really, really fun show, though. I've had a lot of, had a great time talking with people and buying stuff. And you guys are gonna, I hope you guys like the article that I wrote about this and the gallery of images I've, I've taken uh, with my iPhone since I've been here. It's been great. It's been a lot of fun. I've tried to take pictures of stuff I'll, I'll never see again, or just, just stuff I think is cool that I don't want to buy. And there's, you know, no end to the amount of cool pieces on the show floor in these display cases. So as you can kind of see, there's like empty tables here, some over here. Right, there's just a lot of that right now that people are cleaning house and getting ready to get out of here. Um, baseballs. Just a wall of baseballs. It's cool to see vintage memorabilia at the show. One guy's got like some vintage books, some stuff over here. Just miscellaneous things. I really like that a lot. Of course, you got card guides too. Just tons and tons of boxes of cards. Graded stuff galore. It's been awesome. It's been a lot of fun. It's, it's exactly what I wanted it to be. Every year, it just never lets down. I'm always excited about it. What I realize is that um, trying to find out where you are in the show is actually somewhat difficult to do because there are large signs that hang tell you what aisle you're on <laughs> but sometimes those signs are difficult to see so oh pardon me
Because there's so much to see, it's like when you stop, you think, like, what am I missing when I'm not looking at everything else? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Patrick Greeno here at VeritaCards.com. Now, day five is always an interesting day because it's the last day of the show and dealers start to pack up like midway through the day, like at one o'clock or noon, they start to even start slowly putting stuff away. Um, not uncommon for me to walk in on day five and see even some empty tables, like dealers just up and left on day five, they didn't even go to day five. That's, that's rare, but that does happen. And so as I was walking through, um, I just saw, you know, throughout the day leading up to five, dealers just packing up and leaving, leaving jumping ship, leaving house. Pretty normal stuff expected on day five. Pretty normal stuff. They got a lot of stuff to move. They want to get started early. Totally get it. And auction houses, uh, the smart ones will leave their catalogs on the tables. Uh, so for people to grab on their way out. I didn't get any of those because they're heavy to move and I got I gotta carry you know briefcase and whatever or I'm sorry luggage. Um, and so I didn't grab any of those but the REA ones, the memory lane ones were all spread out on their tables. Those are really great catalogs for those of you who haven't acquired one yet. definitely make it a point to, to grab one of their catalogs on the way out. Uh, something to look at. always good stuff in those catalogs. So I was walking through and I was taking video footage with my phone and uh, my phone's data plan, I don't get to do, uh, I don't get to record a lot of stuff and, be, and it'll just like, it, it eats into my data pretty badly. So I was stuck with data limitations and so I had to delete one or two small two minute clips and but we'll just talk about what I discussed as I was talking. Um, I wanted to pick up some vintage baseball literature this this year I did that in 2012 and I liked it. I bought one book. This year I bought two first editions for a dollar fifty each. They're just really old. One's from '47. In fact, I got them right here. Um, this one's cool. This one's Bill Stern's favorite baseball stories. This is a 1947 first edition. I think it's 1947. It's just no no dust jacket on it, and I I probably won't read it because it's it's pretty old. 49, 1949. Um, but it's in pretty good shape otherwise. Uh, it's just got nice straight uh, binding, no mildew or, or any significant um, uh, condition flaws. Just a nice clean example. This will go nicely on my bookshelf. And then this one is Modern Baseball Superstars. And this is a cool cover because it's got Tom Seaver, Roberto Clemente, and Willie Mays on the front. They look like um, trading cards, well stacked, like playing cards. And on the back, it looks like Richie Allen, Hank Aaron, and Johnny Bench. So I grabbed this, and this one has, you know, uh, interesting, interestingly written. It's that the font is big and the spacing is big, so it's almost like it'd be a good bedtime story for a child. I bet if, you know, there's ever a time where I have children, I'd, I have lots of excellent books to read to them. So this would be one. So I grabbed this just because it's it's very thematic. Like I, I it works for my office and. So it'll be a nice add to my bookshelf. I don't think I'll read it. I just wanted to get something baseball literature. I've been scouting the baseball literature availability at the show throughout the week, and there was one dealer who had a bunch of different unique pieces on day one, and I I thought to myself on day two, I'd just go back and grab something. So I, I sought that dealer out and found him, and he had sold all the, the, the one piece I wanted. Um, not a big deal, but I was glad to find these two books on the way out of day five. I was walking out the show on day five and this, this guy had a couple of bins of various sports books and they were split up by sport. And so I went through the baseball box and picked out the two books that I thought were interesting. Glad to pick up some vintage baseball literature here. I'm always happy to do that. It's not that heavy, it's small, it fits in my backpack. So I'll just probably just take it with me in my backpack on the plane. Um, what else? I took video footage of a guy's baseball literature collection, but all the books were really expensive, anywhere from $50 to 200 bucks. So I think that they were either old first editions and or signed. I didn't really even take a look because I wasn't going to spend $200 on a book. Um, I don't need them signed either. I just like the, the feel of old, high, good condition vintage baseball books. And so I wasn't even going to take a picture of them. But I recorded that and then my phone was like, your, your data, you've reached your data limit, and I was like, ah, oh, I can't even take another photo, so I had to delete that clip, but I am I love reading, just not at that price point. I'll read it like a dollar, dollar fifty, two bucks for used books like this, and up to twenty for new books, depending on what it is. Um, so, 
Glad I got some baseball literature, long story short. And uh, I was going through the showcase. We'll just discuss some things here as we talk about the cards. We'll talk about a card and then discuss something to keep it interesting. Um, the most unpleasant looking card from the 1973 top set is the Reggie Jackson. And it's just a horrible picture. I mean, it's just probably the worst photo of any of the cards in the set. This card is rampant with interesting photographs, but the Reggie Jackson is just terrible. I got this because I wanted one, obviously, but um, the significance of the photo, the player, I love the 73 top set. Just a cool, excellent set. And this one's pretty battered. I like that. It's cool. So I grabbed that. And that was, uh, I think it was like 50 cents or a buck. I don't remember, but whatever. Card pricing. So it's interesting that, that I'll go to a booth and see, say, an 87 Donruss Maddox for two bucks. And I go to another booth, and that same card will be 15 or 20 bucks. Never 20, I think it's 15. And I'm like, gosh. That's such a huge discrepancy, and most of the time I see them on the lower end, you know, two, three, four, five bucks. Granted, five is, is even rare. I bought a bunch of those this show, um, but uh, I, I see that often. I'll see it in one spot. They're this price that it's a you know normal price for out in the wild, and another showcase they'll be on their own as standalones with some other classics, and the prices will be high. One guy had a stack of like 80 tops, and I was like, "Do you have the Ricky Henderson?" He had two. One was 50, one was 70. I was like, we're too far apart, but just curious, what do you ask? He's like, well, I can do 60 on this and 40 on that. I was like, you know, I hate to say this, but I mean, I got two, I got one or two copies of the, at the show, I think one copy actually, $15. He's like, yeah, I can't go that low. I was like, no problem. I mean, I, I'm not going to spend more than I need to. You know, I've walked away from deals at this show because um, I, I don't want to spend... You know, if I'm, if I'm buying 20, 83 tops Boggs rookies, I'm not going to pay you five bucks a piece on them, but I might pay you three to four. You, you have to give me some kind of a break for that kind of quantity. I'm not asking you to go way down, but, you know, work with me a little bit because I'm buying quantity from you. Um, so I had to walk away from a deal today, much like I did on day one with that brick that I, I, I reference often. Um, so I just figured that stuff that can be had online all day long, I, I can buy those again, so I'm not worried about it. Uh, it's it's fine. So just be, be, just because you have the money, doesn't mean you have to spend the money. You know you don't want to create a precedent that you know someone spent 20 bucks on an 87 Donruss Greg Maddox rookie card. There's no need for that because there's so many varieties, so many availabilities, so many options to get that card for so much cheaper. So I want to talk about card pricing. Uh, show location challenge. Now this show on each of the uh, the rows. There's um, big signage that tell you what row, like, you know, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900. And so I had a couple times during, during the week, I had a hard time locating those signs. And because they, they had that extra room, they opened up that partition, the extra, like, red carpeted room at the far end. Um, it's almost like you look down from one end of the, the, the length of the, the show to the other end of the length of the convention hall. And you can see the visual periphery close. <laughs> it's like really incredible. Uh, but I had a difficult time locating uh, my my alley wherever I was at the show a couple. It's a couple times at this show. I love the Chicago venue though. I think it's great. It's just it's it's a solid option for the national. And I really like that there are hotels peppered all around the the convention hall. You can just walk straight in to the show. So cool. So next on the list here. Uh, there's a gentleman who sets up at the same location in the Chicago show who has um, snap type bricks of certain insert cards, the same card, like, you know, he's got Bowman Heritage Gold Refractors, he's got a stack of them, or, you know, in this case, um, the Upper Deck 40 Man uh, Rainbow, um, and number to 40, and so I went through those, and I was looking for just whatever. And I pulled out yet a third Cliff Floyd card, number 40. These are really cool. They're pretty rare. I guess the gentleman who acquired these, that dealer, got them from a former government employee who had passed on. And he acquired the collection through that, I guess, the estate sale or whatever. But I guess that guy was, he put together this whole set. Now, mind you, this set is, like, extremely big. For, for example, this is card 781. 
So this card, this set is really, really big, and putting together these these to 40 rainbow parallels is actually quite difficult to do. I rarely see these. This guy had like probably I'd say four or five hundred of them, and I went through them and pulled out the clip lore. There were two bucks each. I thought that was a good deal. I was happy to get this for two bucks. This is 2002 Upper Deck 40, man. This is a great uh, portrait photo of Cliff Floyd. So I picked up three Cliff Floyd cards at this show. Maybe I'll start a little PC of his high-end stuff. Who knows? Uh, budget reserve for the next, uh, for, for day five. So what I've, I've learned this show is my, I've grown as a collector. Okay. I've grown as also a, a spender. And I've grown as a, a buyer of uh, baseball cards so I say spender in anything I buy but then specifically cards and I say this because what I've learned in this show about myself is that and I learned this on day five it, it's it's best to keep a couple of hundred bucks for day five the end of day five like the last hour you never know what you're going to run into I, I I'm coming home with a couple of hundred like almost 200 bucks I'd say of my reserve my 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 my, my say what I brought to the show um, my budget and I wasn't sure what I was going to find on day 5 and I didn't want to be stuck in a situation where I spent all my money and then on day 5 I find an amazing deal for you know a couple hundred bucks and wish I hadn't spent my money on you know the 83 Tops Wade Boggs rookie stack or whatever um, and so I, I keep that money so when you come bring a couple extra hundred bucks on top of your budget to have for like the last couple of hours of day 5 you never know what you're going to come across I didn't come across anything today that I had to have. The stuff I bought, I didn't spend that much money. Uh, I don't even think I spent 100 bucks today. I probably, I don't even know if I spent 50 bucks today, to be honest with you. Um, but what I got, I got some really cool things that are just nice pieces, low end stuff, but cool pieces. Uh, so I just figured, if you say you're bringing uh, 1,300, bring 1,500, and have that extra 200 bucks in your pocket for the last for for day five, to arm yourself for just in case. You know, it's like a, it's like an emergency reserve for a just in case purchase that you come across that is great. So, for example, today I saw a '54 Tops Jackie Robinson in an SGC authentic. I think it was just an authentic or a one, and the guy wanted 100 bucks for it. And I was like, that's really, it's clean. It's got great centering. Why is it 100? He's like, we'll flip it over. And the back, most of it was missing because I think it was glued to a scrapbook and it was peeled off, and most of the back was missing. So I was like, eh. A little, 100 bucks a little steep for that card. It's a great, beautiful card, but I've seen so many beautiful cards at this show. I could fill my phone up and still not take even photos of like even a percentage, a single 1% of what's at the show. But I didn't buy that. But that would have been one of those things like if it, was, if it were 50 bucks, I may have bought it, but not at $100. And I would have had the money to do that because I just just in this that final day those final last opportunities to grab up stuff so um didn't buy that one but that was a cool piece i liked it uh next on the list is the you might remember 1997 jose cruz jr was the big prospect that year and i picked up this in the i think this was like in a 10 cent box or 25 cent box or something this is the 1997 bowman international jose cruz jr so it was a big card for a minute back in 97 his career didn't really amount to too, too much, but I, you know, when I look at his cards, I'm reminded of 97. He and Kerry Wood, um, who else was in that Bowman set that was popular in 97? Aramis Ramirez was, you know, Lance Berkman, Travis Lee, obviously, he was, he was probably the biggest one in that set in 97. Um, so when I saw that, I was like, I gotta get that for 25 cents, no problem. Uh, this year, the, I bought, you know, junk wax cards, I, I, I worked on my reserve a little bit to add to it. Um, the winners came in, and here are the three big winners of the junk wax. The, when I say winners, I mean I bought the most copies of these three cards. Um, 87 Donruss, Greg Maddox. 87 Donruss, Barry Bonds. I say Donruss, it's like Donruss and Leaf, like between the two. So just they're the same looking card, they say Donruss or Leaf, depending on what the brand. So 87 Donruss, Leaf, Barry Bonds. But the one who came in first is 86 Donruss and Leaf, Fred McGriff, rookie card. Those are the big three that came in first at uh, the, 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 the top at the top tiers of, of the most copies this year. Only a few Griffies this year I got. Maybe 
10 or 15 copies between Bowman, Donruss, and Fleer, and one classic. Just not a lot. They're just, they weren't, they weren't in abundance like they've been in, in previous years, at least not in the price points I'm willing to pay. That's another thing, too, as I talk about, is that just because I can afford to pay five bucks for an 89 Griffey, Donruss Griffey, I'm not going to do that because of how many there are out there in the wild. Even two bucks is high, but now at this point I'm willing to pay two bucks. I used to pay a dollar, dollar fifty for those because there's so many of them. And I paid a dollar for a few of the ones I got this year because they were just thrown in dollar bins. But um, I'm at the point now where I, I'm okay paying two bucks for that card. And so only a few Griffies this year and a couple of Gwyns, picked up a couple of Ripkins, um, a couple of Lee Smiths and the dollar bin stuff. All, a couple Ozzy Smiths picked up, a, picked up a Brett rookie, a Winfield rookie, a Rick Anderson rookie. I got a Ken Dryden today, or yesterday, or we talked about it, I think. It was, so I'm just thinking about the rookie cards that I acquired in that sort of vintage to Junk Wax era. And, um, oh, I picked up uh, one Mark McGuire uh, 85 tops. This one's uh, cut, it's trimmed. And this one, I believe, was in the dollar bin, uh, one of the guy's dollar bins. And I was like, well, if it's in the dollar bin, it's a classic card. I'm just going to grab it. So I think this is an authentic one that had just been cut. So other, I, Otherwise, I didn't buy any uh, Mark McGuire's this year. As you come home with a few, but this one's going to have to make do with my one Mark McGuire 85 tops purchase. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a great, great day today. One gentleman had a, you know, you see all kinds of weird, kind of obscure sales techniques. Uh, priced as marked, but it's 90% off Beckett, and so you see this hammered car that has Beckett high. Of course, who cares what book value is anymore? And it'll be 90% off, it'll still be overpriced. It'll be like the condition of this, uh, this Reggie Jackson, or, mm, let me see, I picked up some hammered vintage this year. Let's see if I can find one. Not these ones, but I've got a really bad 76 Reggie in here. Yeah, here's... <laughs> Actually, i got a really bad 73 Tom Seaver. This one's pretty bad. It's really in bad shape. So yeah, this is something I'd see like in a bin that would say 90% off book, and I'm like, okay, fine. But even if book is like 10 bucks, I wouldn't pay a dollar for this because it's just trashed. But I might pay a quarter. You know, I might pay 50 cents, but I think that'd be my cap. And here's a here's a 76 Reggie. Just completely destroyed. Now I look for things like like I said, I avoid mold and, and water damage, but these look just look like they've just been trashed, wrinkled, and just um, they've had horrible surface condition flaws. Uh, I really like picking up the 75 Seaver. So I picked up three more of those. Really dig the Seaver from 75. The reason being, and this is a story I can just share with you because it's not too terribly private, um, is that when I was in Taekwondo in the late 90s, I would say 90, somewhere between 96 and 98, between those two years, uh, I was, it was before I got my black belt in Taekwondo. I got my black belt in Taekwondo in the summer of 1998, and I was training all the time. And I trained with another gentleman who's about my age, and he had his black belt already. And we were talking cards one day. I was like, yeah, I, I collect baseball cards. And uh, he was like, really? I was like, yeah. I was like, I'm into Griffey, Frank Thomas, all the guys in the 90s who were big. I, I, I filed those guys away. He's like, I've got some cards. I was like, great, what do you have? And he's like, I got some stuff from the 70s. I was like, wow, that's awesome. Like. He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll give one to you. I was like, and at the, when I heard that, I was like, he's going to give me his baseball cards. <laughs> the story gets interesting. So he brings the cards to Taekwondo the next day, or one of the days after. And I go through them, and I pick out the 75 Tom Seaver. I was like, wow, really old Tom Seaver card. Tom Seaver is like a legendary pitcher from the Nets. It's like, I was like, this, so I'd like this stack. And he's like, just pick one. I was like, just one. He's like, yeah, just one. I was like, okay, I'll take the Tom Seaver. So I grabbed the Tom Seaver 75 tops, and I was so happy to have it. It's just such a rad card. I don't know why. It's, it's a memory I have with that card. And it was one of the oldest cards that I had in my collection of a Hall of Fame player. 
Um, and it was after I'd acquired the 78. Um, 78 tops, Nolan Ryan, uh, this guy, which I've acquired three of as well at this show, in mostly pretty okay condition, uh, off-centered for the most part here. The thing about these vintage cars is I get them even when they're really bad centering because they're fun to look at. Picked up three Dale Murphy rookie cards. Oh, here's a Tony Perez from uh, 66. It's really badly centered, but this is another card I like. And when I find them in various centering, I, I, I just grab them because I like them. But not valuable. They're not, there's not a lot of value there. One Burt Blyleman, man, last year I must have come home, or the year before. I had like two pages of that card. I, found, I got one this year. They're over, they're like priced crazy. Like you might find a, a Blyleman in a, in a one or two dollar box in some random condition. Uh, today at walking out of the show, a guy wanted six bucks for a one that would have been a one or two. And I was like, man, I can't do that. Get them online, like shipped in PWEs for like around two bucks. So I, I passed. I've been doing that a lot, a lot this year. And I think it's why it's a big reason why I, I got to the point where I had some extra cash left over after the show, which is good because you know you don't want to spend too, too much. Um, well, it's fine. I mean, if it's all relative, right? If you have a lot to spend, you can spend a lot more. One guy had a, um, I wrapped around sort of the back area. I was just kind of walking around between. Four, five, and six. Well, four or five rather, because the show closes at five on Sundays. And I was walking around, just kind of visiting, making my last perusals. And um, I came across a gentleman I had talked to previously, and we just caught. I was like, "How was your week? It's a good week." Had some small talk, and he had a couple of single row graded card boxes with various price points. Pretty good prices, I think. And I came across a 90, 1990 Leaf Carlos Bayerga. PSA 10. It says sticker price 10, and I was like, would five an offer of five bucks be too low? He's like, done. So I got that for five bucks. This card used to be huge in the early 90s. Huge. This was one of the big cards to get in the 90 Leaf set. Obviously not the not the tier of Frank Thomas level, but like maybe a tier or two under that. You know, of course, sort of like David Justice, John Oliver, Larry Walker style, like right in there. Um, and so I, I thought this was cool because I have the Larry Walker and the Allerud. Now the Bayerga. Um, I'd like to acquire um, the David Justice. I have the Sosa as well. I just like this set. And I remember in, in 1990 Bayerga being one of the big rookies to get. Um, and so I was glad to get the 90 Leaf Bayerga to 10 for five bucks. Those are my highlights for today. I mean, I picked up miscellaneous other stuff, but uh, it's it's just whatever. I'm not going to bore you with that stuff. But um, I thought these were good pickups. They were, like I said, pretty affordable. I don't think anybody spent 10, 50, 15 bucks today, or 50 bucks rather today. I think my budget was pretty modest today, which is fine. I was happy to get what I got today. And I think the whole show, by and large, was great. It's, it's always just floors me how much stuff is... Uh, is is in that that convention hall I, I didn't see all of it but i saw as much of it as i could and i had a great time looking at everything there are certain booths i didn't really pay attention to because they might have had you know ticket stubs or uh jerseys or whatever stuff i don't i don't particularly collect at this time and so i just kind of walked past them and just kind of looked around and paid attention to, to whatever was in certain showcases that might have you know drew my interest and i would take photos and whatever so it was a great day great day five and um thank you for tuning in throughout the this 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 full cumulative episode covering my entire uh 2019 national sports collection convention experience at the donald e stevens convention center in chicago illinois and um let me know what you think in the comments area about certain pickups i got uh ones maybe i didn't get that i should have been chasing you know if you have a if you think like Patrick, you should have been buying Wanda Franco or Shohei Otani or whatever, you know, post a comment below. Let me know what you think, or you know, which one of the cards that I discussed. Which one did you like me talking about? Which one of those cards did, did you like the most of the stuff that I discussed in this video? Or you just want to say hi? I just like to get some feedback from you guys to, to hear what you think about some of the stuff that uh, that I've acquired and um, just your thoughts.
Thanks for tuning in to Radicards TV on Radicards.com. I'm your host, Patrick Reno, and until next time, enjoy collecting. If you like this content, please subscribe. Thank you. Enjoy collecting.